Hi guys, it's Claire Nocti. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to take you on an experiential dive into the energies of Porva Bajapada Nakshatra. It has been such a profound journey for me to investigate, and I'm really excited to take you guys with me through it all today. It's my hope that through this documentary style research video, you'll be able to tap into this nakshatra on a tangible and experiential level through connecting with this nakshatra's archetypes in our modern mythologies. The collective information, archetypes, and shocking patterns that Porva Bajrapada natives channel through their lives and art take us on a trek into the dire state of the dark night of the soul, the abyss and occultism, in which these natives naturally dwell. They coax and guide us there through their own grappling with the intoxication and momentum of true freedom presented cosmically for the first time. Through their struggles, they bring us to tangibly face and consider the sacred nature of the immortal soul. How is it saved or lost? What is required in the battle to maintain it? What do we become as we lose our soul? Porva Bajrapada contemplations, as you will see, are essentially the heart of all sacred teachings and especially bring alive and personify the warnings and words of caution presented to those on the spiritual path. Here one encounters the situations of great consequence that all scriptures try to prepare you for, and the dangerous but necessary teetering summit of which they encourage you to climb. To understand this key transformative nakshatra, it's important to establish context. What is our cosmic state before encountering the energies of Porva Bajapada, and what will be our resulting state if we can successfully pass through its extremely difficult tests? Immediately prior to Porva Bajapada nakshatra is Shadabahisha, which is located in the center of Aquarius, the natural 11th house of one's community and social group. It's symbolized by the circle and relates to the power of the links between an undifferentiated group and how the group mind is capable of controlling and obscuring or even victimizing the individuality of a person, just in the way that Rahu, Shadabahisha's nakshatra lord, eclipses the sun. The illusory nature of Rahu here, combined with Saturn's Rashi rulership, means that this tends to be where illusions and taboos are enforced that lead to suppressed and limited expression due to social shaming or fear of abandonment. So this element of Shadabahisha enforces not the laws that serve to protect personal power and freedoms and doesn't relate to divine or natural laws, but relates to the more illusory laws that seek to keep energy dispersed amongst the group with no individual rising up. This nakshatra tends to demand submission from an individual to the group simply for submission's sake. Its roles are ephemeral, flickering constantly, based on the prevailing current cultural climate and even shared insecurities and repressions that form the collective mental consensus. It is the eyes and ears of the collective that limit and restrict individuality so much to the point that those in submission to the approval of the group mind often go their entire life without being able to experience their own true nature. They do not truly know themselves because they are always in some way acting and speaking out of expectation as a piece of the social structure rather than ever grappling with truth or morals directly for themselves. Under Shadabahish's veil, each individual could be lacking all true virtue or integrity internally, but are under the illusion that they are good or self-controlled, when they are actually just artificially controlled and kept in a nice shape and protected by the group's pressure. So before overcoming Shadabahisha, one is in a state of duality and division. There is some degree of separation between the private inner feelings and the outer behaviors. Porva Bajrapada surpasses the state of Shadabahisha and is the height of Jupiter's energy, triggering expansion that 
breaks the constrictions of the circle and even joining with Jupiter's Rashi rulership of Pisces. It is the cosmic chance for one to completely transcend the illusory limitations of the group mind, to experience one's own true nature, uncontained and unlimited in any way whatsoever. Here, a person is transitioning into the 12th house, which rules isolated locations and retreats, where one is cosmically free from the eyes and ears, the restriction of the collective. The isolation does not have to be literal and physical, but is a state achieved by Porvibhadrapada natives where they separate themselves from society internally through philosophies that drive them to question the veracity of Shatapesha's roles. Here one has this unique expansive opportunity in which there is neither outer limitation of the society, nor as you'll see as we go, is there the correlating inner limitation to this. You only maintain a position in this nakshatra cosmically, in fact, when you yourself do not possess inner restraint, as well as do not conform to outer restraints. In removing limitation and taboos of all kinds, the aspirant finally has the opportunity to experience the total freedom and expression of their own true nature, and this is what makes this a dangerous nakshatra. In the sense that there is no limitation, it's a time of universal mercy where there's no outer punishment, so the expansion here becomes grotesque and putrid and totally out of shape, as you will see very tangibly as we go. When all outer restrictions are shed, the necessary restriction to save oneself from uncontrolled, unshaped growth becomes one's maintenance of the restraints required for their own sacred purpose, and whether they can remain affixed to these through the enthusiasm and rampant expansion that provides every temptation here to fail. Here is the cosmic chance for the heart of each thing to come to the surface, and in that way it is a period of free behavior, a test, before cosmic judgment. This nakshatra asks, what true good would it be if a person would do something that would ruin their soul, but just doesn't from an artificial restriction. That individual then requires the cosmic punishing forces, constant assertion, and continual threat to restrain their behavior. This reveals the inherently vampiric nature of many of those who have not yet been tested or proven their integrity or their self-responsibility. Instead of concealing impurity like Shadabhisha, Purva Bajrapada allows even the most grotesque parts of a person to become magnified and grown to such an extent that they are extremely apparent. And that's what makes it a key state of the spiritual sacrifice and the burning of one's impurities in order to be liberated or, as you'll see, the dissolution of the soul into the very same impurities to which one clings. If you are able to find inner restraint and fixity to that sacred purpose, immediately one passes to the next state. In Uttarabhajapada, we encounter a powerful condition beyond outer constraint and with immense outer expansion, but coupled with inner restraint and control that keeps that expansion in shape. So Porvabhajapada is a dive specifically between these two points, between the strong artificial outer control of Shadabhisha and the strong inner control of Uttarabhajapada, the uncontained nakshatra where one is presented freedom to act on their truest desires. The uncontrolled wilds of this nakshatra is literally the abyss in occultism, correlated to the desert, the dark night of the soul, in which a person has no outer guidance or false restriction, no help at all from the punishing shaper of reality, nothing at all within the thralls of outer freedom, but the strength of their own soul, the anchor of their personal integrity to hold on to, to move to the next stage, or facing the loss of this inner light in this very high stakes nakshatra. These natives dwell in the abyss naturally and are also demonized bringers of ideas that force others to reveal their own nature and enter the abyss as well. This is first tangibly shown through Thelema, the spiritual philosophy of Porvabhadrapada moon native Alistair Crowley. Thelema has as its main doctrine the concept, the only law is do what thou wilt. 
The only sin is restriction, a contemplation on the spiritual necessity of a person having the freedom to experience their true inner desires and impulses. It is the question, how does one test their true inner state when their behavior is artificially enforced? Only in having absolute moral freedom and seeing what you would do with it, can you experience the real state of your soul and its consequences, which thrusts one out of the false but protective control of the collective naturally, guiding them to this abyss testing state. Many correlate the lima to hedonism due to its no-holds-barred nature and encouragement of pursuing one's own will. But this is a misunderstanding. The wilds of freedom are actually the hardest territory for one to enter while maintaining their soul in sanity and requires the most discipline of all. The only restrictions that one should put on are those in accordance with their true will, their dharma. Unless you're tethered to your own integrity and disciplined, you will easily fall into acting on bad behaviors out of accordance with the well-being of your own soul when in this state. That's why people are often poisoned when they first interact with the lemic ideas of freedom. It's not the concept of freedom that poisons a person or Crowley himself who is some devil, but the impurities within the aspirant that wants to do something reckless or weak that harms their soul with their own God-given freedom. They enter metaphorically into the wilderness, out of the limits of society that had allowed them to seem to be human or civilized, and most actually devolve into being an animal in this wilderness state of the abyss, thinking it's a license to mutate, embrace depravity, while others display their true consciousness and humanity within the testing wilds of it, elevating them into the higher state. This is shown in an interesting way in the show Strange Angel about occultist Jack Parsons in his first encountering of the lemic ideas. He enters the abyss symbolized in occultism by the desert, as you will see as we go, and mutates into a wolf form, abandoned to his impulses, as he battles with this new freedom of having to face his real nature with no civilized restriction. The more people grasp their true selves, the more they come into focus. Do you know why people don't like having their picture taken? They're scared of what they will see. This freedom functions as a two-edged sword, allowing for greatness in those who hold on to their true will as they overcome the falsehood and illusions of the negative side of Rahu that kept one undifferentiated into the collective, but ruining those who defile themselves and reveal their lack of integrity when the veil is lifted and the circle no longer restrains their form. When all societal and self-restrictions are removed, including those which would have contributed to one's purpose, what do we become in merging into freedom? except an animal, uncontrolled and wild. This is why Crowley stated that the doctrine of the Lima is actually the strictest code of conduct that was ever forced upon humanity, despite people thinking that it is licensed to do whatever they want. The hardest code to upkeep that requires your own self-responsibility and that absolutely no one else can do for you is absolute devotion and knowledge of your dharma, your true purpose and will, once the puppet strings of society are removed. And here it is revealed that morality is relative depending on what one's sacred purpose is, which is a wildly dangerous idea to wield for the first time and for those without inner guidance. In the hands of most, outer freedom doesn't end up being the ability to fulfill one's will, but rather it becomes an enslavement to whatever inner weaknesses they can't control and that direct them away from their purpose. This concept is shown in art in the film Horns, written by Porva Bajrapatamun native Joe Hill and starring Daniel Radcliffe, who can himself have this moon. In this film, his girlfriend is raped and murdered. Despite his declarations of innocence, he is shunned by the community who blames him, entering the cosmic isolation state and wakes up with a pair of horns protruding from his head. After growing these horns, whoever he encounters begins to impulsively act on their truest, uninhibited, and unashamed desires, exactly in the way that individuals act when they contact the energies of the Lima, foregoing repression and the fear of shame or punishment. Two repressed male cops in a car begin to have sex. You know, you guys really want to stop following me around. Telling us what to do now? Well, I mean, wouldn't you rather just suck each other off right here? When I was a kid, I used to shoplift gay porno mags from the drugstore. Then my dad found them under my bed and he cracked me with his belt. You see, you've both been brought up to believe it's a sin, but it's just being human. I think about them all the time when I'm whacking off. I want to kiss you on the mouth when you talk dirty like that. People dive into promiscuity and infidelity. News reporters become viciously violent in pursuit of a story. You know what? I got an idea. How about you guys beat the shit out of each other 
and the winner gets an exclusive interview with me. Porvabajapada energies immediately expand the true nature of whatever encounters them, annihilating any false outer restraint. So, when a person has this next chapter in their chart, the planet placed here acts in an unconfined way that can be very powerful, but if not carefully watched, restrained, and checked for impurities, can pull a person's entire momentum into the stirring of corruption and grotesque energy that eventually can even grow to consume and harm the potential elsewhere in the chart. The extra content to go along with this video for my patrons is an exploration of specific ways that each planet can behave in this next chatra. While Shadabahisha is the concealing star that hides the true nature of things through fear, it's in Porvabhadrapada where this false mask of social approval is removed. Here, the two-faced symbol of the Badrapadas can be understood. Before this state, an individual is secretly divided, but in Porvabhadrapada, the inner state is finally revealed. In transcending this division and revealing the two faces, Porvabhadrapada Pada sparks the state of the individual who is now, willingly or unwillingly, removed from veiling, controlling restrictions, and thrust into intense momentum to display their true qualities, even though it creates either inner or outer isolation from the collective. This can be understood, for example, in that the writer of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a story about the duality and division of one who is outwardly good and inwardly evil, a Victorian exploration of outward respectability and inward lust, had Shadabesh Moon. In Porva Bajapada, that division is overcome. A prominent relating theme throughout Porva Bajapada art is the deal with the devil storyline. Firstly, the core classic legend of this motif, Faust, was written by Purvabhajapada Moon native Johann Goethe. The devil's agent in this story, Mephistopheles, approaches Faust, a man with immense potential who had worked hard over his life to master sciences and gain knowledge, but who was discontent with his level of influence, worldly gain, and his being trapped under human limitation. Faust gets the idea to begin working with magic and invoking spirits to push these worldly boundaries he feels entrapped by. In this way, he has amassed poor Vibhajapada merit and potential for this testing state, the expansion out of limitation, where a person can wield more power and potential that frees them from the collective, so that it can be seen what they would do with this power. Mephisto approaches him, offering him freedom from all human limitation for the rest of his life if only he gives Mephisto his immortal soul afterwards. Mephisto says, I am part of that power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good, calling to mind the thelemic contemplations of the freedom of choice that allows the essence within an individual to be revealed, whether it is corrupt or pure, as being how to allow for true virtue rather than the mask of such a thing. The devil in this legend works hand in hand with the benevolent force that allows one entry into heaven. I quote, Mephisto can be a force of good or evil, inducing a man to surrender to his lowest instincts and give up the quest, or driving him by persistent prodding and frustration to find the fulfillment of his ideals, i.e. salvation. Total freedom to act on one's deepest desires is this metaphorical wilderness that Mephisto leads Faust into here. No force or Saturnian limits to correct, punish, or keep you in check. The punishing force here can only come from within you, and therefore corruption has stronger potential to grow and expand here than anywhere else if you do not assert your true will and purpose onto your own behavior. Temptation to use the freedom and potential to gain things easily and sacrifice your own moral code or dharma to gain is the primary fuel that feeds the corruption here. All things come forward from Jupiter's mercy and abundance during this cosmic state that tempt you away from your own will. The outer ease and lack of obstacles here means activating inner severity is necessary, and that's why in this state, as proposed by Goethe, it is understood that good versus evil is basically stripped down to strength versus weakness, or strive Striving for improvement versus passivity. Actions done in strength, with effort towards improvement, builds the power of the soul and discipline of the body and mind in service to it. Actions done here in weakness, to be given something easily that you didn't earn, to go along with temptations pulling one away from the soul's purpose, are soul ruining. A large influence on Faust, which is referenced multiple times throughout the story, is the temptation of Christ by the devil when he entered the wilderness. There in the desert, he was offered to rule over all the kingdoms of the world along with other things, if only to give up his divine will to be crucified. Porva Badrapada Moon native Martin Scorsese created a film focusing especially on this particular element of the Bible, which relates to this nakshatra's cosmic stage. 
Your heart is so greedy. It pretends to be humble, but it really wants to conquer the world. You're a liar. When you were making crosses for the Romans in Nazareth, your head was exploding with dreams of power. Power over everyone. You said it was God, but you really wanted power. Now you can have what you want. Any country you want. All of them. You could even have Rome. In the film Angel Heart, Porva Badgerpotam Moon native Robert De Niro plays Mephistopheles, who's tracking down the soul of a man, Johnny Favorite, who he granted stardom in exchange for his soul years before. Lucifer. <laughs> Even your name is a dime store joke. Mephistopheles is such a mouthful in Manhattan, Johnny. Johnny Favorite then wished to escape the consequences of such an act and killed a young man in a sacrificial ritual to try to steal that boy's identity to escape the devil. The flesh is weak, Johnny. Only the soul is immortal. And yours belongs to me. Mephistopheles in the legend is himself a damned being, forced to dwell in a kind of hell and serve the devil. This relates to the way Porvabadrapada natives dwell within the abyss, and so are both those who are tempted with the most expansion and freedom, as well as those who tempt others to be pulled into this wild and uncontrollable realm as well. Crowley's unrestricted nature and controversial behaviors were an example of his personal struggle to deal with the responsibilities of the true freedom that he channeled and was himself thrown around by, and in this way he beckoned others into this state. In the film Rosemary's Baby, an aspiring actor is offered the opportunity through a powerful Satanist to secretly give his wife to the devil to be impregnated with the Antichrist in exchange for his fame and success in Hollywood. The character, Guy Woodhouse, is played by a Porvabajapada moon native. As Rosemary is unknowingly carrying the baby Antichrist, Guy's acting competitor is blinded so that Guy gets the part he wanted. Those who suspect the coven and try to warn Rosemary die mysteriously through magic, and he begins being given film offers by huge production companies. Paramount's within an inch of where we want him, and suddenly Universal's interested too. And we're gonna blow this town, we're gonna be in the beautiful hills of Beverly, with a pool, and the spice garden, the whole schmear, and the kids too, Rome. Scout's honor, you heard what Abe said. We're getting so much in return, bro. This can also be noted in the film Phantom of Paradise, directed by Porva Bajrapada ascendant native Brian De Palma, in which a composer is revealed to have made a pact with the devil years previously for the fame and wealth of the woman he loves, who would play his music, a punishment from which he's trying to escape. Now we're in business. Together. Forever. The film Bedazzled is based on Faust, and in this film, the devil is played by Ardra ascendant native Elizabeth Hurley. And this can be understood in that Ardra and Porva Bajapada Nakshatra are both ruled over by forms of Shiva, Rudra, and Ekapada by Rava, respectively. In both of these nakshatras, a person must activate inner severity. And so, film devils are often played by one or the other, as they are different encounters relating to him. Ardra relates to the baptism of water in which individuals are initiated into the youth of reason and the rational mind to determine between good and evil after exiting the Garden of Eden. Before this, when the energy was naturally united with the Creator, how could they be tested at all? One is able to realize the things they do wrong and repent and make effort to improve, relating to Ardra Shakti being the power of effort, Yatna Shakti. In this way, Rudra here is in a state of crying or howling for us, even if we demonize him for it, criticizing us and pointing out our flaws and errors, even when it hurts our ego, as it is actually the most merciful action that saves us. Porva Bajapada ties to the baptism of fire relating to Ekapada Bhairava, where the criticism and punishment is relinquished, and the devil smiles instead and offers you to merge with your impurities completely if you wish to, attaining all of your desires with absolutely none of this character or soul-building effort required. Were you baptized? Yes. John baptized with water and they killed him. Now I baptize with fire. 
Mephistopheles is described as providing the tools for the inevitable self-destruction, exploiting man's weakness, and empowering them to ruin. One is put to the test and must demonstrate here that their distinction between good and evil is not illusory or dualistic, but is correlated to their understanding of what actions align with their true will, and that they have the strength over their weaknesses to be able to serve that will. It is the trial where one must value the soul above all things, which is why the pact with the devil proposes the opposite, to value all things above the soul. Before Ardra, such as in the babyish Rohini and the wild Ashwini, there is no cosmic reward that comes from breaking the rules, just as a child breaks rules not through philosophy, but through ignorance. And thus, the consequence is not there, just as the intent is not. Then, before Porphyrbhadrapada, one is in the state of evolving, and their mistakes are balanced by the punishing force, to basically always adjust and in that way bless you to be freed over time from your own negative behaviors and continue to improve. So before the state of Porvabhadrapada, there's neither the reward of liberation that comes through breaking illusory restrictions, nor is there the threat of soul loss or damnation that Porvabhadrapada is playing with in having approached the threshold of final judgment. This can be understood in a quote by Crowley, the way of mastery is to break all the rules, but you have to know them perfectly before you can do this, otherwise you are not in a position to transcend them. Here we shed the rules that we are not supposed to follow, sometimes requiring aggressive or severe action that leads to rewards, and you're choosing the rules that adhere to your purpose, which is key that you deeply know by this stage, to not get ruined in the freedom. In the Mahavidya goddess system, this absolute freedom relates to the goddess Kali, who uses the Mars Bija cream in order to invigorate and loosen the energies of Saturn, the limiting force that balances out the abundance of Jupiter. Kali is the goddess of transformation, and in basically removing the limits of Saturn, she removes a person's breaks. She removes delays or obstacles to their transformation, and in that way she's called the devourer of time. And in that same way, she functions like Thelema, to bring a person immediately to the abyss state through granting them total freedom in which one must take absolute self-responsibility. We are all destined to face our end physically through death, where we realize that the experience of time was granted to us through Saturn holding together our physical form within the bounds of time and giving it its structural integrity. It is the ahamkara, or the ability for us to maintain our individualized consciousness in our body and experience time's illusion, and all the lessons that having the sacred opportunity to have a body and a dwelling place for the eternal soul can bring. To be under Saturn and to experience time and progress and to work hard and to accumulate wisdom. However, this time period inevitably ends. Along with approaching one's physical death comes the correlating examination of the conscience, which is what this nakshatra, symbolized by the deathbed, more specifically relates to than physical death, the facing of the state of our soul. So in removing time, Kali gives us the chance to be brought to that examination on a spiritual level. She removes all Saturnian limits so that you can see your own level of self-mastery. How would you move if you were completely unbound? In untying your hands, do you harm yourself through uncontrolled actions or dive so deeply into debauchery that you become merged with it. This is why Kali is said to protect and empower even thieves and criminals, as she lovingly allows people to act on their true essence so that they can experience their inner nature and its consequences. Or when she allows you to become unbound, do you prove that those binds didn't need to be there in the first place? Because you demonstrate self-control, and actually in her removing them, you are finally able to complete your true will. Fuel with purpose and blessed by her warmth and lubrication to be released from illusory restrictions that were keeping you in mediocrity. Porphyrbhadrapada women function like female versions of Crowley from a sensual dimension, as seductresses wielding the idea of freedom and immersing their perceivers into his or her own weaknesses or uncontrolled behaviors. For this reason, these are the primary women throughout history to be cast in roles as traditional femme fatales, disastrous women. In this analysis of the top femme fatales of all time, the top three all had moon in Porphyrbhadrapada, and in the Wikipedia listing of femme fatales, a very prominent amount have Porphyrbhadrapada placements, especially class 
classics like Rita Hayworth, Alita Valley, Jean Tierney, and Ava Gardner all have moon here. The feminine only in a state of annihilation, rapidly bringing things to their end and forcing individuals to come to cosmic judgment. They're gatekeepers of this dark night. So for this reason, they do often get blamed for the impurity they lubricate to show itself when he dips in and is rapidly pulled into the intoxicating momentum of her unbound energy. An iconic song written for the film Gilda is called Blame It On Mame, a song in which the woman is blamed for all the world's catastrophes. And this expands on Porta Badrapata women's function as a type of scapegoat. When they had the earthquake in San Francisco back in 1906 they said that old mother nature was up to her old trick. That's the story that went around, but here's the real lowdown. Put the blame on Maine, boy. Put the blame on Maine. One night she started to shim and shake. That brought on the Frisco quake So you can put the blame on Maine, boy Put the blame on Maine They once had a shooting Up in the Klondike When they got damn a groove Folks were putting the blame on The lady known as Lou That's the story that went around But here's the real lowdown Put the blame on Maine, boy Put the blame on Maine Maine did a dance called the Hitchy Coo That's the thing that slew my groove Put the blame on me, boys. Put the blame on me. Basic Instinct is a prominent femme fatale film starring and directed by Porfir Bajapata natives. In Basic Instinct, a woman suspected of murder seduces the detective investigating her into a dangerous love affair in which he teeters on the edge of death, never knowing if he will be killed after sex or not. You like watching me do it, don't you? She encourages within him a total lack of restraint and remarks on the feeble nature of his self-control. Do you have a cigarette? I don't smoke. Yes, you do. I quit. Congratulations. Oh, I found some in my pocket. Would you like one? I told you I quit. It won't last. You working on another book? Yes, I am. What's your new book about? A detective. He falls for the wrong woman. What happens? She kills him. Immediately after contacting her energies, he becomes more sexually invigorated and aggressive towards other women, takes up the smoking and drinking that he'd given up, and is brought into the reckless freedom she encourages. Often compared to Basic Instinct is the film The Last Seduction, starring Porva Bajapata native Linda Florentino as the femme fatale a sexually uninhibited woman who openly expounds on the illusory nature of morals and encourages her boyfriend into murdering for money and killing her ex-husband. You murder. You want to live bigger, but there's nothing you'd kill for. You're talking about murder. Yeah, so? Oh, I'm sorry, it's one of the commandments, right? Think about what you say. Is it the morality of murder that bothers you or the personal risk? Murder is wrong. Yeah, unless the president says to do it. In Gilda, Porva Badrapata Moon native Rita Hayworth coaxes her ex-partner Johnny into constant jealousy, hatred, and anger. As Porva Badrapata plays on the most potentially uncontrolled impulses within a person, especially their sexual nature, and the violence and anger also inherent in our most animalistic qualities, and often uses this ability to get people to go out of control for her benefit. You do hate me, don't you, Johnny? I don't think you have any idea how much. Hate is a very exciting emotion. I hate you too, Johnny. I think I'm going to die from it. What Manny Vasquez used to call you? Bitch, mostly. Decide whether you're a total bitch or not. <laughs> 
total fucking bitch. <laughs> In so many Porva Bedrapata films, the victim is led into one of the 12 house subjects of death or imprisonment. Kill my husband! Goddamn right! Right here. Goddamn right! You, you killed my husband! Goddamn right! Miss, miss, I have located you and I have a car on the way. In Orange is the New Black, Porva Bajapata's son, native Laura Preppen, leads her partner Piper into drug trafficking that leads them both to the imprisonment that is the setting of the show. On a related note, Cape Fear, directed by Porva Bajapata Martin Scorsese and starring Porva Bajapata Moon Robert De Niro, a vengeful, devil-like man comes back to punish a lawyer who neglected to give him a fair day in court, despite it being his lawful duty. De Niro is able to twist the situation to where the lawyer seems like the one who is wildly out of control, even as De Niro is stalking him and his family and killed his dog. Poor Fabajapata natives and being almost a personification of the wilderness itself tend to have the ability to coax out bad behaviors and then flip the narrative to their benefit. Get your hands off me! What's your problem, mister? Similarly, the classic horror book, The Great God Pan, was written by Porva Bajapata's son native, Arthur Mackin. I quote, Mackin was obsessed with the concept of vestigial evil, a sort of will to wickedness that clung to the back of men's brains like a hungry parasite in spite of all of our science, manners, and political correctness. In this book, a scientist unleashes the god of chaos, Pan on a little girl through an experiment that he supports with the idea of moral relativity. And she becomes animated by the devil, sexually freed, bisexual, polygamous, encouraging orgies and other things like that in those she encounters. Like Rosemary's baby, she becomes the vessel which will bring hell to earth, the surrogate mother of an abomination, a child who will usher in apocalypse if left unchecked. So in this way, these women function as a dark muse, revealing the traits you are hiding from yourself and allowing you to shed inhibitions, or coaxing you into debasing and betraying yourself into anger and rash actions that you're later punished for. In Cape Fear, it's quoted, I will let no man drag me down so far as to make me hate him, relating to the way Porva Bajapada natives stir anger and lust in others purposefully in order to feed them to the corrupt parts of their impulse, if that is what they deserve through their lack of mastery over these emotions. They teach one the importance of harsh actions needing to be done out of duty and not emotion. That's why Kali is tough to control, as in removing Saturn, she said to be able to make a person respond out of anger. Porva Bajapada and Kali archetype women are a Shakti to handle that is the most extremely rapidly transformative for their consort, in an unbelievably exhilarating and freeing way for the pure, or a dangerous way for the corrupt. Even unconsciously and out of her own awareness, these women will not limit or correct male energy, but instead bring to the forefront any latent defilements or corruption within him. They speed up his transformation with their inner Jupiterian tolerance and expansion. He finds not only does he not have to hide his tendencies from her, but she will often present him with opportunities for freedom in these films that he hasn't even considered. For example, in these films they will offer threesomes with two men or women. How many lovers? What, do I get extra credit points for experience? Man? No, man. no man. or other sexual offers, invite him to use violence, to indulge in excess, and to question normal morals. This kind of temptation coming from a woman, when women are usually the restrictive counterpart, makes it that much more exhilarating to him, an impetus nearly impossible to resist. I'm starting to feel like some kind of a... Sex object. Yes, exactly, a sex object. Live it up. This relates to the way that in the Yoni Tantra, Kali is assigned as the Yoni Chakra just the absolute energy. No physical restraint of the yoni rim that controls him like Bhaglamukhi or Matangi. No nourishment of the inner yoni such as Kamala or Bhuvaneshwari, but only the raw and ethereal power itself, undirected, like the two-edged sword of freedom. The scapegoat quality that I mentioned earlier is something I've discussed in another way relating to the sexual quality of Mars nakshatras, and especially Mars's height, Danishta, where Danishta women are made scapegoats in a more sexual manner relating to desire and jealousy. Porfa Bajapada and Danishta are the two lion yonis, and are both these kinds of scapegoat women who allow for total warmth and freedom. 
With Porfa Bajapada, it's philosophical, while for Danishta, it's visual and physical. You can contrast this to the literal man-eating and dominatrix energy of Ashlesha, which is destructive in the opposite way. Ashlesha is the finicky cat yoni, which is dangerous through its extremely tight, snake-like constricting of male energy that's not virile enough to bring satisfaction. I discussed the warm, hearth-like yoni of Dineshta opposing Ashlesha that does not shape or scorn a man, where a man encounters extreme openness and energetic looseness. I keep referencing in this video the way Porva Bajrapada unbinds a person, and you can remember the way in which Ashlesha contrastingly is constantly depicted as binding a person. The lion yonis, like the female lion as the huntress, have this powerful, unchained, undomesticated quality that is freeing to their consort in different ways. This can also be seen in physiognomy. You may have noticed how similar the features of the Purva Bajrapada Femme Fatale women were. While Ashlesha women tend to have high cheek apples and a dainty appearance, Porva Bajrapada women tend to have larger, heavier, and wider cheekbones and somewhat thicker frames. Both with narrowed eyes, but with Porva Bajrapada dominating, they can tend to be smaller in comparison to the face overall than Ashlesha, in a similar manner to comparing a cat with a lion. These women call to mind La Diablesse, a character in Caribbean folklore. The legend says that she was born human but became a demon through her deals with the devil. To others, her poise, figure, and dress make her seem beautiful. However, her terrifying face is hidden by a large brimmed hat, and her long dress hides the fact that one leg ends in a cow hoof. She walks with one foot on the road and her cow hoof in the grass. She can cast spells on her unsuspecting male victims whom she leads into the wilderness. When in the forest, she disappears and the man, confused, lost, and scared, runs around until he falls into a ravine or gets attacked by animals, etc. And this can be compared to the experience of these women bringing a man into the abyss. In Hinduism, La Diablesse relates to a class of spirit called Dakini, which are female fiends or murderesses rolled over by the goddess Kali. These non-limiting women teach something important about what the female role is at this cosmic stage, and even the way that the typical female role is all but missing here. Essentially, Porva Bajapada women, and being unrestrictive on their male partners, function almost more like men energetically. Nobody treats me like a lady here. She should not be sitting at this table. It's like imagining a yoni with no walls whatsoever just the raw power of sexual energy itself. The yoni is missing from Purvabhajapada essentially because as the height of Jupiter, it's highly phallic. For example, the top of the pillar of mercy in the tree of life is represented by a phallus as it relates to giving with no restriction. The one-footed quality of Ekapada Bhairava is said by many to be phallic in quality. A phallic emphasis and obsession can be seen in the artwork of these natives such as Felician Rops, as well as the highly worshipful attitude towards the phallus in Crowley's work. On the Tree of Life, Binna, correlated to Saturn, is represented by the image of a yoni. Barani is symbolized by the yoni and ruled by Yama, the protector of the Dharma or cosmic order, who is responsible for the punishment that is void or delayed here, where one is free to do absolutely anything and is tested in that manner. So, the Dharma and Yoni give us our spiritual and physical form respectively, and they are not distinct and separate. In Porvabhajapada, the removal of this feminine reductive shaping force and punishment leads to grotesque distortions that form when the male principle, unbalanced, simply expands and accumulates. This terror and avoidance of the feminine principle can be shown in these films which insist on the perspective of women as bringers of disaster, cosmic threats to the unchecked expansion desired at this stage that comes through avoidance of the yoni's draining reduction. In the film Teeth, directed by Porva Bajapada and Mitchell Lichtenstein, the sphere is illustrated in the depiction of a woman with vagina dentata, teeth in her vagina, that castrates all men who enter her with bad intentions. Teeth is a body horror film, and this particular genre is truly dominated by Porva Bajrapada creators. The genre relates to the horror when the scare is not through some external being, but the disgust of your own body as it loses shape, mutates, and degenerates into a disgusting or animalistic state. Two commonly compared body horror films are Altered States and The Fly both by Porva Bajapada creators. In each film, a scientist makes a breakthrough of some kind through having attained strong potential by not applying restriction or restraint on themselves and forgoing the limitations and delusions of the collective. 
In breaking out of restriction, one of two things can occur. The transformation into the unrestricted animalistic subhuman state, which is what usually occurs, or the evolution into a superhuman state, arising above the collective. Here, you find out which of these two forms you take when breaking into freedom's transformative power. In altered states, this transformative potential is tapped into when the scientist, Edward, discovers a certain substance of which, if he consumes it combined with entering into an isolation tank, any of his visions begin to become reality and change his form. He loses the ability to speak for a time as his vocal cords degrade and experiences episodes of physical, biological devolution. Emerging from the tank as a gorilla in one scene, a feral caveman in another. He had blood all over his face when he came out of the tank. He'll claim it was goat's blood from that goat he was eating in his hallucination. Do me a favor. Take a look at these. What's the story in this case? What are you looking for? Well, it looks to me like the architecture is somewhat abnormal. Somewhat. This guy's a fucking gorilla. Touching the wild freedom of the 12th house realm relating to these visions, he cannot control how he becomes an animal within it. A metaphor for the same uncontrolled behavior we saw earlier through touching with Pervabhadrapada energies. In the fly, the scientist, Seth, discovers how to teleport objects in a way in which things are broken apart in one chamber and then put back together in another. Accidentally, he transports himself when a fly is in the chamber, which combines their DNA and sparks this grotesque transformation. I was not pure. The teleporter insisted on your purity. I was not pure. The scientist remarks quite metaphorically that he was not pure and is therefore devolving, alluding to the stage in the way that absolute purity and self-control is required to experience the positive rather than the negative end results of the freedom that arises here. Opportunity for unbound expansion simply becomes distortion and deformity when not balanced with a shaping and restraining inner power. Inner restraint is more necessary here where there is no outer restraint than anywhere else. If there is even one unchecked weakness or impurity within us where we would give in to negative temptation, in Jupiter's immediate tolerant expansion and removal of all reductive or corrosive forces, it grows to consume us in totality and pull us into our own monstrosity, while we watch helplessly. Again, these animal transformations show that it is here in this lawless stage, where one gains the knowledge of whether they were really human or if they were just restrained by the collective to seem that way. I'm saying I'm an insect. <laughs> who dreamt he was a man and loved it. But now the dream is over and the insect is awake. This relates to this stage being of the Adeptus Exemptus, which is the test relating to the sphere of chased Jupiter. It is the test within the abyss, crossing through the mysterious dot to the Binna, Saturnian state of master of the temple, where you shed your limited human personality and are reborn as your own master. You're afraid to be destroyed, recreated, aren't you? I bet you think that you woke me up about the flesh, don't you? But you only know society's straight line about the flesh. You can't penetrate beyond society's sick, gray fear of the flesh. I quote, the essential attainment of the master of the temple is the perfect annihilation of that personality which limits and oppresses one's true self. His understanding is entirely free from internal contradiction or external obscurity. He stripped naked with no protection or restriction within the abyss and must show that he can be his own master which makes him progress to the Saturnian Binna. If one was on the lunar path still at this stage, it's here where Kali pulls back the illusory projection of your inner teacher being outside of you and takes away all tolerance, control, and mercy that a guru provides. Endless mercy is what enables any weakness within a person that must be obliterated here to where they no longer need universal mercy. To become a master of the temple, one must know their thesis and karma and even have given birth to a school of thought, such as the potential to be highly influential that these scientists display. It's the magical thesis and why we see in both these films the individual reaching an accumulation point of potential greatness themselves. Jack Parsons attributed his breakthroughs in the field of rocket science to his work with Thelema. I broke through, Ernest. No bounds. I saw it all, everything. I drew it so I wouldn't forget. This is what's important. This is the future. The future that I'm going to build. Strip away all that we aren't and we see what we are. 
However, these films show these individuals getting lost and destroyed in the enthusiasm for the things like fame and glory that would come through this separation from the collective rather than holding on to its true purpose as it relating to their sacred duty. The enthusiasm and frustration for fame and success of this scientist is what essentially caused him to enter the chamber without caution, which led to destruction, similar to the Faustian themes of trading the soul's purpose for short-term benefits. I'm becoming Brundlefly. Don't you think that's worth a Nobel Prize or two? In Altered States, his wife even compares him to Faust, saying, You are a Faust freak, Eddie. You'd sell your soul to find the great truth. In both Altered States and The Fly, their female partner watches in horror as they bloat out of her grasp and even become physically unable to interact with feminine energies whatsoever through the grotesque being that he has become, relating to the Snakshadra as a period of time without the Yoni and Dharma's restraint and shaping. The more disciplines and restraints a person follows, the better their form becomes in their present life and in future ones. It's said that the less they follow, the more misshapen their form becomes. It's as simple as if you remove the structural components of the building. The building loses its structural integrity, wobbles and collapses. Yama is connected to the Yoni because they perform the same function, just on different planes. The former, the spiritual, and the latter, the physical. I've become free, I've been released, and you can't stand it. The more merciful and tolerant you are about your own impurities, the more distorted you become. If you were to follow the restraint of a fly, that form would follow. While the fly depicts the situation of failing in the abyss and being trapped there forever, altered states portray something different. The necessary action one must partake of to make it through the abyss. I quote, In the final experiment, Edward experiences a more profound regression, transforming into an amorphous mass of conscious primordial matter. Urging Edward to fight the change, his wife, who he had abandoned, grabs his hand, immediately being enveloped by the primordial energy emanating from Edward. The sight of his wife being consumed by the energy stirs the human consciousness in his devolving form. He fights the transformation and returns to his human form, through the retouching with the feminine reductive energy that one must embrace in this state to be safe. Saved. Here you can see a comparison of the final form of a crucial decision made out of weakness and temptation versus one made out of strength. One example where the individual can't get in touch with the inner spark of self-mastery to progress, and one where he does do this. And the difference lies in something set up in the beginning of the movies, which was Seth's main motivation seeming to be for fame and influence, while Edward's was for spiritual knowledge and growth. So Purva Bajrapada is the true eternal hell of Abrahamic religions that relates to soul loss, which is quite different than the purifying hells in Hinduism relating to Bharani and Yama, the punishing forces that mercifully burn and reshape a person's distortions and align them for their new incarnation in accordance with the inner shape they have molded into in the previous life. In the Hindu hells and in Catholic purgatory, the individual is purified by fire for a duration of time in relation to their transgression reshaped to resume the cycle of spiritual evolution. Porva Bajrapada is the permanent true hell of this evil level of mercy, enabling rampant animalism that turns you into a distortion of yourself and caricature of your own vices. This way, and holding onto your ego and impurities and tethering your soul to them essentially when you are tested, you become part of the offering into the fire itself, enmeshed with the impurities burned within it, and thus it becomes eternal rather than temporary. If there are distortions within your heart that you cling onto here, they become permanent distortions of your spiritual form. This relates to Purvabhadrapada being the final sacrificial fire one enters to either complete purification or to be destroyed, relating to this nakshatra's power to give the fire to raise a spiritual person up in life, yajamana udyamana shakti. This is why in occultism it is often emphasized that true harm can only be done to oneself. Other body horrors directed by Purvabhadrapada moon natives, the blob and slither, depict this in shockingly simple similar ways to the fly in altered states, where people are consumed into impurity to the point where, rather than just having their impurities burned off of them, they fuse to these impurities that the cosmic punishing force burns. Here we see the putrid side of Jupiter's endless mercy and resistance to be severe or remove impurity, as a tolerant enabler of the growth of impurity, as the sweetness of fruit when it reaches a state of rot and is festering full of insects, or the body having reached its end, rotting and bloating and requiring to be burned. 
In this way, hellish imagery and hallucinations are very prevalent in Porva Bajapada films. They are primary films notorious for being banned or censored by the Catholic Church. One such banned scene is in Ken Russell's film The Devils. I quote, A public exorcism erupts in this town in which a group of pious nuns removes their clothes and enter a state of religious frenzy. A king arrives claiming to be carrying a holy relic, which can exorcise these devils possessing the nuns. And the nuns then appear as though they have been cured. Until the king reveals the case, allegedly containing the relic to be empty. Despite this, eventually they descend into a massive orgy in the church in which the disrobed nuns remove the crucifix and sexually assault it. This further relates to the scapegoat quality of this energy. In believing they were possessed and without blame, they allowed their truest animalistic impulses to take them over and to descend into orgies, desecration of Christ imagery, when really it was all a placebo and just revealed their own true nature. Event Horizon is another primary example of this Porva Bajapada censorship, as its final hell scene was censored heavily. It is a film both directed by and starring Porva Bajapada natives. In this film, a space crew goes to rescue a ship that had been lost and gone silent called the Event Horizon. Upon finding the abandoned ship, they determine that it has entered some kind of hell realm, and each crew member begins to experience extreme hallucinations corresponding to their personal fears and regrets. They discover a video log of the Event Horizon's crew having entered this hell, fornicating with and mutilating each other. The video log ends with a shot of the Event Horizon's captain speaking the Latin phrase for save yourself from hell. The crew proceeds to be tested and thrust as well into this hell through their past mistakes. In the film Devil, starring Porpa Bajrapada Moon native Logan Marshall Green, he's amongst a group of people locked in an elevator who each begin to die in mystical ways. The FBI, in trying to understand what is going on, brings up the record of each person in the elevator and finds them each to be criminals or sinners of some kind. A thief, a con artist, a man who brutally beat someone, a gold digger. As each is killed, it is revealed that the primary reason for the devil to be there that day was to take the soul of this Porva Bajrapada native who killed a mother and son in a hit and run while drunk a few years prior. Are you ready for your turn, Anthony? Sorry. The whores, the liars, the cheats, and the deserters, it's always the same thing. You know who I am now, yes? I deserve this. You don't believe that. Yes. Yeah, I do. It's my fault. It's all my fault. You think you can make some kind of bargain? Mm -hmm. It is only when he admits to the law what he does and opens himself to the punishment he was trying to escape that the devil can no longer take his soul, as it is saved as separate now from the wrong he'd done, which he's willing to be punished and reshaped for. In altered states, the uncontrolled visions that his cells are devolving into are often satanic in quality, such as imagery of Jesus with a goat head, implying the unrestricted moral quality blown open at this stage that leads to this crucial spiritual test of integrity, where one is granted the terrifying freedom and responsibility of neither being forgiven for their behaviors and adjusted, or shaped and punished. This experience where there is huge personal consequence for every action. I felt drawn to make this video after Rohini because we glimpsed the importance of sacred impulse in Rohini, but we were merged there with the uninhibited and amoral creator and had to fall from him in Ardra to begin towards the path of cultivating our own divinity. Porva Bajrapada is the final stage of that journey that began in Ardra with the Promethean spark. Rohini muses on its own godliness and feeling merged with the cosmic creative force. The other place you find those interested in their own deification is here, where one is coming to the threshold of proving themselves and becoming master of the temple, a godlike state. This is also something driving the story of Faust. Nothing drove Faust more into temptation than trying to break the restrictions of his humanity and enter the territory of divine power and knowledge. In Rohini's transition to Ardra, the created gains autonomy from the creator and desires freedom and knowledge of moralistic good and evil, leaving the Garden of Ignorance. In Porva Bajapada, the individual finally steps into their own authority and determines good and evil for themselves, the laws in accordance with their own true will, and enter the state of the individuated adept. I quote Crowley, We must understand first of all that the root of moral responsibility on which man stupidly prides himself as distinguishing him from other animals is restriction, which is the word of sin. Indeed, there is truth in the Hebrew fable that the knowledge of good and evil brings forth death. To regain innocence is to regain Eden. What is my true will? For until we become innocent, we are certain to try to judge our will from the outside, whereas true will should spring a fountain of light from within and flow unchecked, seething with love into the ocean of life. 
Kali relates to what is known in Africa as the spirit of iron, what rules over technology. In the Afro-Cuban religion of Lukumi, the spirit of iron is known as Ogun, and is the same force that gives way to the corruption and vice of the Iron Age through technological advancement and the way that technology, just like the Faustian Pact, allows one to gain things with ease without effort or delays. Saturn rules iron, which allows us to reshape the natural world however we want, cut down forests, build railroads, guns and cities, change our form through plastic surgery, or mutilate a person in war. It allows for distortion of the natural world in ways that are difficult or impossible without using it. This is why railroad spikes are often used when worshipping Ogun to symbolize his connection to industry and the power of that to speed things up, but also the dangers of industry giving people too much ease and distance from nature's purifying severity. Although the term Kali Yuga relates to the Iron Age and not the goddess Kali, Kali still does in fact connect to this time because of her associations with Saturn and by extension iron. With the ease technology brings to the West, a very large percentage of people are able to avoid any physical labor or effort, drive everywhere instead of walk, eat absolutely anything, and live in ease. There is constant entertainment through technological devices and tempting instant gratification all around. As I mentioned earlier, Ardra is extremely prominent in dystopian sci-fi that explores the dangers of technology and encourages others to make effort. Porvibhadrapada is where unrestrained behavior, temptation, and excess is so great that it becomes extremely hard to resist, becoming almost one with the technology itself, and being consumed and merged with it in the next type of body horror that I will show you now that Porvibhadrapada explores frequently. When individuals use iron and create things far removed from the natural world or dharma, it creates a weakness that is eventually corrected by nature, whose law is equilibrium, who devours weakness. The dharma is eternal, whereas all distortions are temporary. Saturn is exalted in Swati Nakshatra, and this nakshatra focuses on technology as a learning tool with constructive purposes. Purva Bajrapada, however, shows more deeply the danger of technology and the mystery of how some choose to enslave themselves under its illusion, while others use it simply to speed up their transformation and be able to improve themselves. The sword can liberate just as the chain can enslave, and many people become grotesque in ways that literally were not possible before this age through the ease that it provides and the self-improvement that it makes optional rather than necessary for survival. The film Upgrade stars Logan Marshall Green as well and depicts a lot of these themes as they come together. It's described as a Faustian technological body horror. Here the temptation of technology to give a person gains with little to no effort becomes a devil itself. As said of the film, it's an interesting glimpse into a future where the devil has been digitized and Faustian bargains are the equivalent of iTunes user agreements. In the film, the Porva Badrapada character, Gray, is in a futuristic world that he despises as he rejects technology in comparison to those around him and sees its dangers. However, when he's paralyzed in an accident and a tech innovator offers him the chance to regain his walking through getting a technological implant called STEM, his will caves into the offer, thus forming this type of pact. STEM, he's got a knife! STEM! Ah! I can see that. We can see that. You're trying to piss him off? Okay, all right, so what's the plan? What are we doing? Stop! Stop him! You now have full control again, Gray. Slowly, Stem convinces Gray to give the machine more and more control over his body, allowing him to win fights, solve crimes, and evade police the more he allows it to control him. Stem speaks to him and becomes the devil on his shoulder. The more he lets this devil control his every move, the more success he has in his worldly pursuits. It's revealed that Stem was slowly taking him over completely, breaking his mind, and then entrapping Gray's soul into a dreamlike state while the computer controlled him in totality. No! 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 You are not in control! I am! This isn't here. Grace not here anymore. He's in a better place. 
in his mind where he wants to be. I've taken over now. All I needed was for his mind to break, and he broke it. Goodbye. A huge and constant theme in the work of Porva Badrapada's son native, David Cronenberg, is this same sexual and biological invasive union between man and machine, such as in films like Existens and Crash. The latter watches about individuals who fetishize the transformative power of car wrecks and the distortions from metal in this nakshatra in that manner. Relating to the expansive, grotesque, and even tumorous nature of this nakshatra, Cronenberg explained that he likes to make films from the point of view of the disease itself, as it takes a person over completely. I know what the disease wants. What does the disease want? It wants to turn me into something else. In this unaired Porva Badrapada Moon native Chris Farley skit, you can see a man who becomes so large from overeating that he merged with his car itself, and people call him Tortoise Man. A more comedic symbol for this disregard for self-regulation. Unregulated and essentially unwilling, embarrassing transformations here happen that lead to one being ostracized for their lack of control when handling freedom. This can be seen as the dark side of the Matrix starring Porva Vajrapada Lawrence Fishburne. While Swati relates to the positive use of technology to learn skills in a safe manner and through the mini-world creation that is shown in that video, in Porva Vajrapada and Ardra we also find sci-fi horror and what we can contemplate the darker aspects of entrapment by the technological illusion that can take place. Cypher in this film makes a pact with the program itself to trade virtue and truth for ignorance, but wealth and fame as an actor in the false reality. Then we have a deal. I don't want to remember nothing. I don't want to be rich. You know, someone important, like an actor. Whatever you want, Mr. Wigman. The film compiling so many of these previously mentioned themes is Cronenberg's Videodrome. In this film, the ambitious owner of an erotic TV station named Max, who is looking for something that pushes the boundaries and limitations of his industry. Your television station offers its viewers everything from softcore pornography to hardcore violence. But don't you feel such shows contribute to a social climate of violence and sexual malaise? I care enough, in fact, to give my viewers uh a harmless outlet for their, their fantasies and their frustrations. Well, I think we live in overstimulated times. We crave stimulation for its own sake. We gorge ourselves on it. We always want more, whether it's tactile, emotional, or sexual. I admit it. I live in a highly excited state of overstimulation. Max stumbles upon a broadcast that is a real snuff film. Got any porno? You serious? Yeah. Gets me in the mood. When he shows it to his poor Rabajapada moon love interest, Debbie Harry, she's uninhibited, completely open to it, aroused by the murder, violence, and role breaking. What's this video draw? Torture, murder. Sounds great. God, I can't believe it. You turned off. No, 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 it's okay. I can take it. Yeah, it turns me on. Take out your Swiss army knife and cut me here, just, just a little. Luring him into this dark underworld with more intensity through the sexual energy she brings as a femme fatale archetype. I wonder how you get to be a contestant on this show. I don't know. Nobody ever seems to come back next week. <laughs> what, what, what did you say happened to your shoulder? You want to try a few things? She enjoys it so much that she actually goes to find the broadcast and to become part of the show, and then beckons him more and more into it. Come to me. Come to Nikki. The main character begins to mutate due to the erotic freedom the snuff broadcast caused him to experience, and the show itself is revealed to be a weapon to warp the brain of anyone who watches it and create the growth of a tumor that causes hallucinations. The main character loses control of his own transformation due to his desire and willingness to push the bounds of sexual morality. Towards the end of the film, when Max is being programmed by those who created the weapon, the programmer asks Max, Why would anybody watch a scum show like Videodrome? implying that anyone who would want to watch the show should do so and suffer the fate and mutation that its uncontrolled nature eventually causes. Why? Expose you to the video drum signal. It really does work on just about anybody. Anybody who watches it, Max. 
A final technological body horror that I want to touch on is Tetsuo, which was inspired by Cronenberg and stars Porvabajapata Moon native Tomoroo Taguchi. It begins when a man who has a fetish of sticking metal into his body runs out into the road and is accidentally hit by this Porvabajapata businessman and his girlfriend. The couple disposes of the corpse in hopes of quietly moving on with their lives. However, the metal fetishist is not actually dead, and through this bad deed, he plagues the businessman with a disease that throws him into a rage-fueled transformation of his flesh into iron. As his transformation accelerates, the businessman dreams of his girlfriend dancing erotically with a hose-like phallus before sodomizing him with it. It has to be understood that just like women are energetic projections into matter, so too is technology. This is why when a person loses control of illusion and allows it to control them, there's oftentimes a metaphor of a woman overcoming the man sexually. Next, his penis is transformed into a large metal drill and he soon loses control, attacking her. She stabs him in the neck and then commits suicide by impaling herself on his drill. It is then that he fully becomes the Iron Man. Here it can be seen the way the feminine yoni restrictive force is removed here which is what allows for these monstrous spiritual and physical distortions. The fetishist then reaches out to the Iron Man again, explaining his vision for a post-apocalyptic world consumed by metal. They combine into a single phallic monstrosity and charge through the streets promising to burn the world. The last statement of the film is regarding a type of apocalyptic male love here. This sheds more light on the leaning towards only the phallic principle that I mentioned earlier. This film reflects the homoerotic quality in Crowley's life and work, and his detailed expansion compared to perhaps anyone else in history on gay sexual magic and how it is performed. Crowley alluded, for example, to the number 11 relating to the double phallus of homoerotic sexual magic and its unique power to expand endlessly with absolutely nothing being a ceiling or reductive force to stop it. Poor Vabadrapata is cosmically unchecked male anabolism, like how Barani is unchecked female catabolism. In this way, Crowley explained that the destruction of the world would be brought through sacred male union. Ken Russell's film Women in Love and similarly with a statement by the main male character to his wife that love of women is not enough, there is another eternal love and bond for a man. Porva Bajapata women film archetypes, in being internally so Jupiterian as well, are frequently pictured allowing or urging love between men, even with her own partner. And this nakshatra is certainly present in cinematic representations of polyandry and male bisexuality, such as in the film The Dreamers and Cronenberg's Crash. You can see this as well in the Porva Bajapata sun star of Tiger King, who I will discuss more shortly. Goethe once wrote, I like boys a lot, but the girls are even nicer. If I tire of her as a girl, she'll play the boy for me as well. And he owned a copy of the Gita Govinda. It's in this text where Radha reverses the rules and overcomes or dominates Krishna, who is known to be a male form of Kali. In Afro-Cuban religion, it's stated that spirits will take possession of a person through the anus, which is why it, as a body part, is ruled by the eighth house, Randhara Bhava, meaning hole or aperture. In the Kama Sutra, men who like to be penetrated are called, interestingly, possessed men, Upasripta. Passive sex is when you allow yourself to be possessed by the person who is the one doing the penetrating. Existence and Videodrome both show the male character opening a yoni-like hole in his body that allows him to be programmed, and Crowley described a ritual where one is penetrated by the holy guardian angel to be possessed. Krishna, who was described as effeminate compared to his brother Balarama, is shown dancing on the serpent instead of the serpent or woman dancing on him, as other gods do. He is the man who will do the dancing for a more still woman who possesses him. It's interesting to parallel this with the early Jupiterian qualities of Punarvasu that made them prone to domination by the feminine force in an unwilling way by Ashlesha energy. So with the sexual freedom here, there is a lot of wild sexual experimentation and taboo breaking. Men also adorn themselves in feminine style clothing in many Porva Bajapada films such as those that are on screen now. The destructive element of male sexual magical union alludes to why Ogun is used to help with erectile dysfunction as ejaculating for a man is a form of bloodshed. He assists in the shedding of blood, as iron is even present within blood itself. To 
To shed blood in an imprecise or undirected manner creates huge distortions in reality. While shedding it in a controlled and precise manner, it can be used to restore balance and create harmony. From Crowley's text, of damnation. If you have dared to use the magical force of the holy phallus, its abuse is fatal and deadly. To the man of earth, it matters little if he suffers nocturnal emissions or indulges in reckless sexual behavior. But to you that are adepts, it is ruin absolute. For all that force which passes from under your control, unless it is directed and fortified by your will, so that it is as a loyal soldier faithful unto death, it is like artillery abandoned, seized upon by the enemy and turned against you. Because it is of your own substance, it by nature has a link with you, a right upon you, and all the fortresses that your inheritance of God and your own holy art have built about you are of no force to resist its assault. Be wary, therefore, for obsession, bodily wasting and disease, madness, and even murder upon you may be inflicted by the engines that you, having forged for the service of mankind and for the glory of the Lord, leave to malignancy of the demon, that he may turn them to your own destruction. The films of Porvabhadrapada moon native Martin Scorsese frequently follow a Faustian formula in a more realistic manner than the magical body horror and technological symbolic representations previously explored. The Faustian formula implies a situation where an ambitious person that's gonna take this company into the fucking stratosphere! surrenders moral integrity in order to achieve power and success for a limited term. The resistance to submit to societal restriction and the craving for moral isolation of this nakshatra leads to the uncontrolled expansion of corrupt, tumorous empires of drugs or crime. Scorsese depicts this in repeated stories of an empire built of corrupt excess and power that then must fall and be dissolved due to it being built on a faulty foundation without structural integrity, like placing a huge fat being onto frail and shaky legs, no framework to keep its shape or make it grow in a balanced manner manner where one can control the growth. The Wolf of Wall Street, Casino, The Irishman, and Goodfellas all depict the excess and recklessness void of regulation, virtue, and checking oneself that eventually meets inevitable destruction, pulling those involved down with it. Each of these films contains an iconic scene in which everything falls apart. Each person involved is either killed by the mob or arrested by the police. The Snakshadra is truly mafia energy. Being involved with the mafia is this wilderness, more moralist state of being able to use violence, murder, theft, and so on, and the extreme danger of wielding these freedoms while being protected for a time while doing so. Cronenberg also explored organized crime in many films, and Porva Badrapada native Brian De Palma directed Scarface and The Untouchables, starring Porva Badrapada Robert De Niro, playing Al Capone, who himself had Porva Badrapada it's interesting to see the heavy emphasis of Porva Bajrapada in Scorsese's beginnings. De Palma is who introduced him to his main artistic partner, Robert De Niro. The breakthrough film for Scorsese was Mean Streets, a film about the inferno, hell-like experience of trying to grapple with Catholic morals on the violent streets. All right, okay, thanks a lot, Lord. Thanks a lot for opening my eyes. We talk about penance and you send us through the door. Well, we play by your rules, don't we? It stars De Niro, as well as starring another of Scorsese's early frequent collaborators, Harvey Keitel. This trio worked together on both this and the iconic film Taxi Driver. Scorsese's primary early mentor and one of his biggest artistic influences was aforementioned Porva Badrapada moon native John Cassavetes. Scorsese films beautifully interplay the association of the Sixth House of Virgo and its materialistic dualism, contrasting the inevitable destruction of the material associated with House 12. As I described in the Hasta video, Martin Scorsese frequently casts only Hasta or Parvabhadrapada individuals to star in his films as those willing to break rules, cut corners, and enter this cosmic moralist territory that creates distortions and calls forth this kind of harsh destruction ultimately. Hasta dualistically and deceptively engages in crime, even though it thinks it's bad, while Porva Bajapada engages in crime because it burns away roles, believing they're not rooted in any true morality. I noticed recently while reflecting on this that in the Brihat Samhita, these are the two nakshatras described firstly as being thieves. The Hasta starring films of Scorsese do have a much more material-oriented feeling, 
while his Porva Bajapata films tend to dive deeper. So this is because the mafia is basically a force that organizes and controls substances or behaviors that are deemed illegal, giving people access to those vices. Porva Bajapada as the philosophical and mystical removal of limitation, as the mafia, is an expansive, organized, hierarchical structure that usurps the law of the government. It becomes an alternative dark government setting up the freedom for drug use, loan sharking, prostitution, violence, gambling, and so on. Whereas Hasta tends to relate more to corruption in business, to deception and fraud, and sleight of hand types of crime. In the Russian mob, a member was called a Vori Visakon, a thief in law. And there is a complex code of rules involving never obeying the government as well as other things. David Cronenberg in his film Eastern Promises shows this complex code of conduct and laws that they follow. It's a philosophical structure of rule breaking within a wider framework. Both an adept and a person doing organized crime have a lot in common, both operating outside the false limitations of Saturn and Rahu. The only difference is that one is in accordance with the Dharma and one is not. The Purva Bajapada energy as a cosmic stage where the true substance of one's soul is unveiled is shown in that Scorsese once said that he likes to make films about quote unquote good people who are placed into difficult situations that expose that they are not such good people after all. All untested people in societal chains can seem to be good people. Interestingly, De Niro said that he was doing an impression of Scorsese when he played Mephistopheles in Angel Heart. Outside of the mob, these natives often choose untapped, unregulated corners of society in which to begin to build a kingdom that makes them feel the excitement of independence and isolation that this next chapter craves relating to the stage of Exemptus Adeptus, like we saw with Sun Men being kings of normal things like Hollywood and coolness. Porva Bajapada people are called this but in a way tending to bloat up odd fields and areas that they have free reign within. For example, both stories Polka King and Tiger King start are Porva Bajrapada natives and share oddly similar characteristics. In both, the protagonist craves attention and fame to the extent of paying to have themselves constantly filmed. Both try to bloat up an odd and untapped area of society, tigers and polka, to become wealthy and famous as the king of that area. Now, Jan, you always have so much going on. You're constantly on the road with the band. Mm. You've got the store, the mm. record label, the radio program, Jan Levan flavored vodka, and now Jan Levan European tours. Jan Levan always expanding. And this is the Tiger King gift shop where I have all of my stuff. We got honey, we got barbecue sauce, we have steak sauce, skin cream. I have sex gel for you and her. Sex gel. Uh, the best seller out of this gift shop is actually Tiger King underwear line. People just go crazy over them. It's done really under the septic tank. Baby, you're lucky have a man like me, yeah. I built one of the biggest facilities and the nicest facilities for exotic animals in this country. I am now stepping my foot in the ring to run for president. Both engage in crimes within their field in order to expand faster and allow growth at a dangerously rapid rate and end up imprisoned. In Party Monster, Porva Badger Moon Macaulay Culkin has the title King of the Club Kids, traveling the country to find young people to pull into his ring of excess and partying and learning, I quote, the rules of fabulousness, which mostly revolve around attracting as much attention to oneself as possible. In King of Comedy, a celebrity-obsessed aspiring comedian is willing to kidnap and hijack a famous comedian show in order to gain infamy, since he can't gain fame just through his honest efforts, and he ends up imprisoned, yet gaining fame for this stunt after his release, just in the way Tiger King gained fame while in the walls of prison for his outrageous actions. Rita, mm -hmm. who is your favorite movie star? What is this, some kind of a game? No. Huh? You gonna tell me something about my character, my future, what? Well, you'll see. Tell me. Malin Monroe. Perfect. Talent register, huh? That's her name. She signed this when she was in New York doing her last publicity tour for the Misfit. You know, she died tragically alone, like many of the world's most beautiful women. Who's this? Burt Reynolds. This? Mel Brooks. He's what you call on funny. Others are just regular. Oh, that's Sid Caesar. He's remarkable. I really like him. He's great. Woody Allen. He's a very nice guy. He's a personal friend of mine. Of course he is. <laughs> no, he is. 
Oh, I bet some of these are worth money. Oh, yeah. Especially this one. Just hold it. Who is it? Rupert Pupkin. I surprised you, didn't I? <laughs> Take this as a gift. Take good care of that. In a few weeks, everyone is going to want one. In all of these examples, the individual is considerably hardworking, but devotes all of their efforts towards illegal activities that they're later punished for. They often cling desperately to the notion of being remembered and having their name outlive them due to the desire here to rise out of the collective. The temptation for fame and expansion here often has more momentum than the skill, talent, and caution required, and thus the eagerness outruns them, pulling them into growth that they can't control, wanting to expand themselves and be seen and known, no matter what their status is and whether they have earned it or not, rather than being seen or known for honest qualities or good contributions. Faust contains the Hippocrates quote, Ars longa vita brevis, meaning art is long, life is short. Our works of art long outlive us. One of the primary things that drove Faust to make his deal was discontent with the level to which his work had influenced the world. In that way, there is a strong temptation to focus on one's impermanent identity instead of the state of their soul. In this way, they get caught in the huge momentum here of the material and lust of result, instead of the spiritual and the perfection of the inner state to then reflect outer growth. To remedy against this, Crowley said, For pure will, unassuaged of purpose, delivered from the lust of result, is every way perfect. From the Bhagavad Gita, which I will explore soon as a text that instructs one how to get through the abyss, set thy heart upon thy work, but never its reward. The film Amadeus follows a fictional rivalry between Mozart and Italian composer Antonio Salieri. Salieri had Porva Bedropata Moon, and with intuitive casting, the actor who played him had it as well. Amazingly, the actor who played Mozart also had Mozart's real moon, Gesta. In this film, Salieri pleads and bargains with Jesus in a pact-like way to grant him fame in exchange for him upkeeping good behavior. Lord, make me a great composer. Let me celebrate your glory through music and be celebrated myself. Make me famous through the world, dear God. Make me immortal. After I die, let people speak my name forever with love for what I wrote. He's less concerned by the notion of working hard to cultivate skill to rise out of mediocrity than he is in asking a force to grant him his wishes from a state of passivity. And his actions in this film are riddled in different ways with corruption. He aborts his mission completely when he becomes obsessed with Mozart, a person he believes to have been blessed with true divine skill, and wants to steal his work or destroy him at any cost, similar to the extreme obsession seen in King of Comedy. I will block you. I swear it. I will hinder and harm your creature on earth as far as I am able. I will ruin your incarnation. Your <laughs> merciful God. He destroyed his own beloved. Rather than let a mediocrity share in the smallest part of his glory, he killed Mozart and kept me alive to torture. 32 years of torture, of slowly watching myself become extinct, my music growing fainter, till no one plays it at all. And his. Good morning, Professor. Time for the water closet. And then we have your favorite breakfast for you. I will speak for you, Father. I speak for all mediocrities in the world. I am their champion. I am their patron saint. <laughs> The contemplation on crashing empires is shown in the poem Ozymandias by a Porva Bajrapada Moon native. The poem depicts two travelers happening upon the ancient statue of a prideful, tyrannical leader who wanted eternal fame that is now just ruins in the desert. Interestingly, this poem was also published on a day when Moon was in Porva Bajrapada and read in the modern media by two Porva Bajrapada natives, Porva Bajrapada's son, Brian Cranston, and this poem was also read in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs by a Porva Bajrapada Potter son native, Harry Melling. I met a traveler in an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. Whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command 
tell that its sculptor well those passions red which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, alone and level sands, stretch far away. The poem asks one to contemplate exactly what Scorsese does, the danger and foolishness of valuing the impermanent identity over the state of the soul. He highlights the once great and powerful now fallen, their names all but forgotten. This ties to the Porva Badrapata stage also occurring for all people, whether they are spiritually advanced or not. At the end of life, at the examination of the conscience, where one determines whether they have acted in a damning way or a way that has elevated their soul, something that I will explore in part three of this video about the exit out of the abyss state that part two has been focused on illustrating. But before I move on to that, I want to talk about one last way that individuals enter and dwell within the abyss state, and that is with Porva Badrapada's presence in the field of ceremonial magic and ritual, the calling of spirits and making of packs in order to obtain things easily. The wilderness scenario of wild freedom to face one's inner state is shown in the theme of one or two men entering the desert, nothing but these men alone. First calling to mind Faust and Christ in the wilderness. Modern examples include the famous magical ceremonies of sexual magic performed by Crowley and Victor Newberg in the Algerian desert. In Strange Angel, the two men enter the desert in order to experience their new thelemic freedoms, perform rituals, and take drugs. In Altered States, his visions immediately take him to the desert to face his fears and desires. The notorious ceremonial magician of YouTube, Porva Badrapata Sun native EA Coetting, does this in a very similar way, live streaming himself in the desert evoking spirits. In Porva Badrapata Moon native Tarkovsky's film Stalker, the most iconic scene is a room that is like a mini desert. A guide takes two men to a mystical room where their soul's deepest wish is granted. This sparks a dark night of the soul. A man who went there to bring his brother back to life ended up with abundant money being granted to him instead and killed himself in the realization that deep down he wanted wealth more than to save his brother, relating to Pura Badrapada's nature to reveal all things, especially in tempting a person to betray something important to them for wealth. It's in the desert where lots of the town's problems are solved. Got a lot of holes in the desert, and a lot of problems are buried in those holes. Crowley is arguably the biggest figure of magic in the West along with Eliphas Levy, who Crowley claimed to be a reincarnation of. Eliphas Levy also had Porva Badrapata Moon and was the one to design the image of Baphomet, a symbol which has an abnormal ability to make people speculate about occultism and invoke fear in others about evil sources. This symbol relates to the balance of mercy and severity, as well as true good and evil, that is contemplated here. And its depiction as half man, half animal relates to this nakshatra being the point where one must face and purify their impulses. At the Yogini temple of Hirapur, we find the image of the deity of Porva Bajrapada, Ekapada Bhairava, with his one foot. Ekapada Bhairava was the central male deity worshipped at these circular shrines which were built by followers of the yogini cult. According to David Gordon White, before Bhairava was worshipped, the god who controlled these female spirits worshipped in these shrines was Skanda and he was depicted with a goat head, thus cementing the connection between this type of imagery and this nakshatra. Written under Baphomet is the words solve et coagula, dissolve and coagulate and relates to the stage in which a person must reveal and deeply analyze their own nature and be dissolved and burned essentially to separate from their impurities, but to crystallize the pure soul, they can carry through the abyss to be reborn much like the two chambers in the film The Fly. The test here is do you engage in the harsh task of taking yourself apart and reducing yourself to your best parts, or do you stay merged with the abundant accumulation here that is beginning to rot? Do you cling to some weakness or temptation, which then deforms your spiritual form forever? In Crowley's initiation ceremony into the becoming of a master of the temple, he describes that when entering the abyss and in being disintegrated, the taking apart is actually a fusing together. Essentially, if you 
you want to be whole, you have to divide yourself and remove that which is not really you and transcend duality and opposites. Crowley had an intellectual method for entering the abyss known as Liber Os Abysme, which is a meditation on opposites and antimonies that then causes a person to enter into the abyss, such as the many opposites that Baphomet symbolizes. So evoking spirits is the same situation as wielding the immense but dangerous free potential in this next chakra. If you're not cosmically servile to truth and you are prone to impurity, you cannot control the spirits. Being servile to your own virtues and under the balanced energy of Saturn where you can control yourself, you can control them as well as they are animated by the breath of your own projecting energy. You can see in Ekapada Bhairava. In the Mantra Mahodati for destructive ritual acts, it's instructed to be done while standing on one foot, alluding to the inner balance and restraint required for one to be able to wield these dangerous energies. In Goethe's poem, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, a novice sorcerer does not wish to do the mundane tasks of discipline and effort that build inner strength and control. When his sorcerer teacher leaves, he enchants a broomstick to carry the water that he was meant to carry. When the broom brings too much water and he doesn't know how to stop it, he tries to use physical force to kill the magical broom, but that only results in many more being made and overtaking him completely, lost in the enthusiasm without the inner control, like those with their crashing empires or bloating forms, built without inner power. So a person who has just cut corners or stolen or made packs to get something easily and did not earn the knowledge or attainments for themselves through effort, inevitably they come to face forces that are greater than their ability and knowledge to control. There's a saying in Santeria similar to before you crown, sweep floors and crack coconuts. After you crown, sweep floors and crack coconuts. So gaining fame, wealth, power, etc. are not wrong or unspiritual if it's earned and if it's in accordance with your will and purpose, something I will discuss more at the end about Uttara Bhadrapada Nakshatra. But in Purva Bhadrapada, the zealousness for these things and obsession shown in all these examples with fame and wealth threatens to often and make the individual here engage in using the spiritual potential but making it fully subservient to the material, that selling of the soul, danger at this point specifically. This is symbolized by the upside down pentagram of spirit into matter being evil as described by Eliphas Levy as another common symbol considered to be satanic and relating to this cosmic stage. The final example of this spirit evocation can be found in the ninth gate, where the femme fatale Liana has Porvabhadrapada moon and is a ceremonial magician. Before causing her rich husband's death, she gets him to buy her an ancient book that contains the secret to evoking the devil and making a deal with him. While engaging in the ritual to summon the devil, she wears an inverted pentagram necklace. Two other Satanists in the film criticize her for just trying to get pleasure and wealth, having orgies, without a real passion, skill, or ability to deal with these dark forces. Forces. You're insane, Boris. Give it back to me! You, Liana de Saint Martin, you're even guiltier than the rest of this pathetic rabble. You have at least some idea of what this book can do in your right hands, yet you lend yourself to these farcical proceedings, these orgies of aging flesh conducted in the master's name. You're a charlatan. And this is understood in the way that she is strangled with this necklace. The film itself is an allegory on how to succeed at ceremonial magic, as it shows the common character tropes of people who become interested in the occult, but each fail for different reasons, while the main character succeeds. The main character is a practical and grounded skeptic who doesn't even believe in the devil, uninterested in the unscrupulous Porvabhadrapada frantic obsession with gaining material power easily in a magical manner, and in the film is like the fool, a person walking into dangerous forces but who is pure and innocent in intention and so isn't harmed by them. Another association with the Iron Age is the performance of animal sacrifice 
to a deity or into a pact that has been traditionally expounded upon as being able to give certain spiritual or material benefits when done with precision and respect. This is why Ogun also rules over this sacrificial knife. Without its blessing, you cannot perform ritual animal sacrifice. This also ties to the idea of blood pacts or covenants, such as the Faustian pact, which was sealed with blood. In the Old Testament, the first covenant occurs between Abraham and God and involves the cutting of animals. In Judaism, when a child is eight days old, he is circumcised, which is the sign of the covenant or pact between the Jews and God. The cutting of the body is emphasized for the person to be joined with the spiritual force that they are uniting with. In the case of a pact with a spirit for benefit, the pact is signed with the individual's blood to solemnize it and make it binding, uniting the will of the person with the spirit. The Dark Knight of the Soul is associated in tarot with the Moon card, the card of Pisces, and it traditionally even has two phallic objects on it relating as well to this state. Interestingly, the Moon card is also associated with Hakate, who rolls over what are called the empuse, which are very similar to La Diablaise, also having one hooved foot and tendencies towards seducing people to be murdered. This card is also associated with werewolves, such as the animal transformations seen earlier. Werewolves are said in many cultures to be a vampire in animal form, a being that steals and does not earn its gains and is therefore destroyed by the things that it collects and bloats onto itself that aren't in accordance with its own form and harmony. In it said that a man can attain the ability to turn into a werewolf if they make a pact with the devil at the silk cotton tree. This is why a werewolf obeys the moon. You become a nocturnal being without inner light, controlled by the illusory force of the moon and unable to stand in the forces of light and the sun. Just as this criminal expression that we've explored cannot stand in the presence of truth or government, which is rolled by the sun, and so have to move more and more into darkness in order to survive. When your inner nature is willingly or unwillingly exposed in Porva Bajrapada and you reveal a crooked or corrupt nature, you are forced into dwelling in dark places where those traits are accepted in order to hide from punishment for as long as possible. So when an individual reaches this spiritual state where they are seeking to individuate and rise out of their soul being entrapped under nature and its limitations, you have seen how they are tempted with expansion and excess through the offer of corrupt wealth, fame, power, and sexuality that first presents itself within the abyss. The state of Christ being tempted in the wilderness to give up his purpose for material power. Now you can have what you want. Any country you want. All of them. However, passing this was the easy part. Step into my circle so I can pull your tongue out. It is the reductive energy that comes when you overcome the temptation of expansion that is much harder and more excruciating to bear, which ties to the crucifixion. Holding onto your integrity in the test of expansion is one thing, but holding onto your integrity when being threatened with pain and the loss of all that you have, full of fear and in the thralls of suffering, of torture, and even death, is where only the truly strong can pass. It is the surpassing of the test of fear that is the only way one passes through Dot, and the great spirit spiritual darkness ends. Before you make it fully through, you have to prove that not only would you not trade your soul to gain, but that you wouldn't trade it in order not to lose either, even your life. You have to prove that you're willing to lose anything and everything to maintain your integrity. Otherwise, you never truly had it anyway. You have to bear pain and strain of concentrating and holding true to your morals at any cost. Torture, temptation, arousal, and fear. This is beautifully shown in Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ, which highlights Porva Bajrapada specifically by including a scene not in the Bible that defines this film. In this scene, Christ hangs on the cross to sacrifice all things for the soul of man. During this trial, a guardian angel appears and tells him he has suffered enough. She will take him down. Your father is the God of mercy, not punishment. He saw you and said, aren't you his guardian angel? We'll go down and save him. He suffered enough. He gives in with relief, coming down from the cross, and he goes on to age, marries three women, and has children. Later, his ashamed disciples surround him. You took me in your arms, and you begged me, betray me, betray me. I have to be crucified. I have to be resurrected so I can save the world. What are you doing here? 
What business do you have here? Why weren't you crucified? God sent the guardian angel to save me. Angel? What angel? Look at her. Satan. You've done enough. If you die this way, you die like a man. You turn against God, your father. There's no sacrifice. There's no salvation. At that moment, the horror of his betrayal dawns on him. He crawls out into his city on fire through his failure and begs for another chance, at which time he is able to fulfill his duty, and it is hinted that it may have all been a vision. He dies and he is reborn, as one enters the reigns of Uttara Bajapada, and they have proven they value the soul above all things, proving that he would hold to his sacred purpose even through death. The death of the body is nothing in comparison to the death of the immortal soul. The next two films that I will explore show symbolically the way in which the soul can die, even while the body is still alive when one fails within the Dark Knight. In Scorsese's The Irishman, De Niro plays a contract killer for the mob who then meets Jimmy Hoffa and becomes his bodyguard. His admiration for Hoffa is clear throughout the film and they become very close, trusting one another deeply. Hoffa is strong-minded and he will not cave in to the fear of the mob. He won't change the actions he believes are what he needs to do even when they threaten to kill him. De Niro, who is one of the only people Hoffa trusts, is then given the job by the mob to kill him. De Niro knows that Hoffa is ultimately righteous and honest undeserving of death, and he feels extreme agony at the thought of killing him, but still, to save his own life, a decision made out of weakness, out of temptation to preserve his body instead of being affixed to his beliefs, De Niro kills Hoffa and betrays his inner values. The Porva Badrapata situation of being within a mob, which breaks rules and commits murder, gave him the free setting to cosmically prove himself. That moment defines him more than anything else in his life, it's a symbolic soul death. Who's that with her? You know what that is? No. Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who he is. Okay, I don't. Yeah, yeah, boy. You don't know how fast time goes by and said you get there. The film then depicts the way in which he has lost the divine spark of which no one could have touched. No threat of loss of money, of happiness, or even of life itself can be worth the loss of the divine spark. Scorsese emphasizes this in the way that the last action of the movie is one where De Niro asks to leave the door slightly open. Something he said because earlier in the film, Hoffa had left his door cracked in the hotel room with De Niro, showing the trust which De Niro laid Later betrayed. In Scorsese's film Silence, Porva Badrapada native Andrew Garfield plays a devout Christian missionary in Japan. He watches the bravery of the Japanese who have taken on the faith allow themselves to be tortured rather than apostatize from Christianity. The Japanese government sees this preaching as an invasion and imprison Garfield, ordering him to apostatize and step on the face of Jesus in order to not be killed. And this moment defines the film. Yet when he encounters his dark night of the soul, the moment that all his his words, his years of devotion, his preaching to others, and his beliefs could be put to the test, he closes his eyes to look for the face of Jesus. Come ahead now. It's all right. Step on me. In some interpretations, it could be said that this is Jesus, and in others, that it's the devil. I understand your pain. Step. And he does so. At that moment, the film goes completely silent. The rest of the movie, Garfield is in a state of silence, unable to outwardly practice his faith or stand up for what he believes in, paralyzed and pretending to be Buddhist. 
what life is there to live in that state, giving up both his faith and freedom simply to hold on to the body? He truly dies not in the fire clinging to the cross, but when he steps on the face of everything he ever stood for and believed in, crushing his spirit in protection of the flesh. In a religion based on the concept of the purification of putting oneself through any temptation yet clinging to one's beliefs in the way that Christ himself did. From St. John of the Cross's poem of the Dark Night of the Soul, the only light in this dark night is that which burns in the soul, and that is the guide more certain than the midday sun. The light leads the soul engaged in the mystical journey to divine union. And here it can be considered one of the symbols of this nakshatra being a single ray of light, the only thing to cling to here, where it is a necessity that you let go of all else. We can contemplate the quote, What profiteth a man if he gain the whole world, but loses his immortal soul? Ekapada Bhairava has been described as the one who represents the deathless soul itself, and all of this relates to this transition and the Bajapada's connection to the deathbed and the examination of the conscience. Mulholland Drive is a film that I waited to bring up until the end as it combines many of these themes all layered together. It primarily depicts a dream that a woman, Betty, has entered to try to escape the reality of the fact that she made a devilish pact and will be punished. It stars Naomi Watts as Betty, the character who aspired to attain fame as an actress in Hollywood, and fell in love with Porva Bajapata's son woman, Camilla, in the process. Camilla ends up leaving Betty for a famous director and obtains the role that Betty desired. And for this reason, Betty, out of weakness, lust, anger, and jealousy, makes a deal with a hitman to kill Camilla. He shows her a key and says it will be sitting in her home when the evil deed is done. And so this blue key becomes a symbol for the sin. The entire film takes us through the story, through the veil and symbols of Betty's dream state, and what she is in the escapist illusion that she is a fresh and aspiring actress again, and meets Camilla in a different context, as a woman who lost her memory and instead was in need of Betty's help. Not knowing her own name through the amnesia, Camilla sees a poster of Porphyrbadrapata Rita Hayworth and Gilda, and takes the name Rita, alluding to her femme fatale role as being the one who coaxed out Betty's inner anger and uncontrolled tendencies, and led her into the damning behavior of murder out of jealousy. Throughout the film, they carry a mysterious blue box that they can't open, representing the secret of the sin that Betty had done that she's closed her mind from. As the dream continues, we begin to see hints that Betty is dreaming. She and Camilla go to a club at night that outside the word hell can be seen, to suggest that Betty is becoming aware of what she has done and where she is going. Inside the theater, a man calls out that it is all an illusion, it's a dream, like the Matrix contemplations earlier, that she hears music, but there is no band. If we want to hear a clarinet, listen. Over time, she wakes up completely from this dream and kills herself through knowing what she has done. The devil who was there when she made the pact appears, surrounded by fire. This chaotic realization of what she has done resonates so similarly to the end of Angel Heart, when Mephistopheles returns to take Johnny Favorite's soul and it dawns on Johnny Favorite the true identity where he'd sold the only thing that mattered, that he had similarly tried to forget and escape. In the film Mr. Frost, a Porva Bajrapada moon woman encounters the devil himself and functions as his psychoanalyst. The devil knows that if he can coax her to do something against her beliefs, he can take over her body completely, and so throughout the film he seduces her into killing him. At the end, she murders him in a scene mirroring the blue Saturnian color of these limiting forces rushing back found in Mulholland Drive, and immediately he is able to have ownership of her soul and body in totality, like the ending of Upgrade. Stronger than passing time. 
Gray's not here anymore. All I needed was for his mind to break, and he broke it. The way that fear tends to be the hardest impurity to remove from oneself ties to the tantric practices of meditation within a cemetery. A person must process and accumulate these dark and terrifying energies in order to become strong against them, and to remain fixed even within the chaos of them, relating to this being the only Ugra, fierce Jupiter Nakshatra. Purva Badrapada individuals are contrasted with Jeshta individuals in the Irishmen and Amadeus because Jeshta relates to the traits required required to not fail at this state. In the Irishman, Al Pacino's character is willing to face the risk of being murdered even after being warned with death multiple times, only to never waver from what he believes and to have his own voice, freedom, and dignity. As I've explored previously with Jeshta on the solar path, Jeshta people are always reducing themselves, ejaculating energy and shedding blood which is inherently redemptive. They're always doing penance and improving and punishing themselves, reducing their negative traits so they don't go into that state and so they accumulate skill. The joy from anything they do only comes in conquering their weaknesses to do it, not necessarily the outer thing that they gain. We ended in F major. Yes. So now, A minor. Start with the voices. Basses first. Second beat of the first time. Time. Common time. Second beat of the first measure. Maledictus. Second measure. Second beat. Maledictus. You see? Yes, yes, G sharp. Ah. Uh -huh. Yes. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. Yes, yes. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. Strings in unison. Ostinato on A, like this. <laughs> Next measure is rising. Do you have yes, it? Yes, 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 I think me. so. They don't accumulate that which they can't handle because they don't allow for mercy. They don't want a teacher. They don't want to be given anything. It's wonderful. Yes, 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 yes. Go on. It is only when people accumulate too much and avoid tamasic energies, and they become bloated up with impurities, which is especially common when being on the lunar path of the guru, because one accumulates far more sweetened or protected experiences than harsh ones in that case, and then doesn't have the bravery and power to face the fires. Dryness doesn't lead to rot like juiciness does. If you have been on the solar path all along before this stage, every outer thing you've earned has been paired with an inner virtue built through the hard you overcame, so you kind of glide through this test. Well, it's a very harsh test for those who were on the lunar path. This is why effort and striving is the primary redeeming quality in Faust, and the gods argue that there's no sin, it's just error when the intention is to improve. There's no moral law in the story, but the only true virtue is effort. It is Faust's constant striving for the truth that makes it so Mephisto realizes that Faust had never really relinquished his soul to him and Faust gains entry into heaven. In ceremonial magic, one wears a chain made of iron that represents the integrity and salt of the magician. It is worn around the neck, which is where the abyss or dat resides. Dat means knowledge and Jupiter rolls the ether element in Jyotish and over the Vishuddhi chakra in the throat as well as one's knowledge and wealth in general. The chain symbolizes the power of the operator to keep their word and the reality of the abyss that threatens to disperse them should they violate their oath or integrity. The Vishuddhi Chakra rolls over one's ability to transmute poison and is known as the Poison Purification Center. During the churning of the Ocean of Milk, Shiva drank the poison that emerged, causing his throat to turn blue and him to lose consciousness. The Mahavidya goddess Tara then began to breastfeed him and suck the poison out of his throat, which is why she controls and heals the planet Jupiter and helps to protect the person from the potentially corrupting aspects of this planet, relating to weakness or debasing oneself for wealth or due to one's accumulated knowledge. Kali is the removal of Saturn in time that brings a person to the inevitable need to be consumed by Tara, who is correlated to the cremation fire itself, or they rot and become corrupt in this state. Without Tara's permission, it is said that a person cannot cross the ocean of illusion, a crossing which is the abyss state itself, and her name has a meaning literally as to cross. Kali brings a person to the abyss state by stripping away Saturn, while Tara is the balancing of Jupiter that allows them to exit the abyss. When a person crosses the Vishuddhi Chakra and enters the Ajna, they are said to have gone beyond the three gunas and thus do not produce karma anymore, a state that is sometimes called Agora, likened to being the state of a dry seed. 
This is where immortality is gained because the immortal soul is truly crystallized. In regards to Jupiter and the Abyss location as the throat center, Mulholland Drive and silence and even altered states where he loses his speech capability when failing, emphasize an ending being silence, a failure at this throat center, because this is where a person is deemed worthy either to exist in true freedom or to be silenced. He who does not embrace the Tomasic and Malefic planets to reduce themselves in accordance with harmony lose the ability to expand or even exist anymore and are destroyed along with the gross substance they proved that they were, the vices or fears to which they were enslaved that they then became united with and that then defined them. Here we can understand the power or positive aspect in Purvabhadrapada's constant defilement of Jesus' imagery and its frequent imagery of Christ united with the devil. It's here where one realizes that the devil and Jesus are essentially one. In being a scapegoat and savior, Jesus says he will die for one's sins and that one can be forgiven for anything, which simultaneously tempts people to do things they know are wrong, feeling that they are in the safety and mercy of a protector who will take on the punishment for them and letting them remain as sheep, enabling weakness. This is their moment to prove themselves and become like Christ himself, letting go of his mercy as well as the mercy of the guru in general. In this way, this nakshatra relates to the demon Belial, whose name is said to mean either or both lawlessness and worthless. And Anton LaVey expounded on this meaning without a master, all three alluding to important aspects behind this nakshatra which deals with wanting to not be a sheep. Jesus represents the ego or ahamkara that is crucified through your spiritual disciplines and practices. The ego must be kept in balance by balancing the four elements of the body like the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which uses the four cardinal directions to place one's spiritual body inside of a kind of cross that creates the stability necessary to eventually cause your ego to die from the effort of this balance. Once this is done and the ego dies on the cross of the four elements, the fifth element is born from that ego, which is your egoless consciousness without ignorance and which is eternal and not temporal in nature. The purpose of the ego, like Jesus, was to die so that you could live and give birth to your soul. It's the fuel that allows you to transcend the fluctuations of the material world, which are under the power of the four elements. This is why the four elements are Yod, He, Vau, He, and Hermetic Kabbalah, which is a name representing God. When the four elements within a person are kept in perfect balance, the fifth element, the Redeemer, Shin, or the Ether element, is given birth, which is why Christ's original name was Yeshua. The true privilege is to struggle and suffer for your purpose, and the true horror that you must let go of is the thing that soothes your ego and encourages weakness in you. When the four elements are balanced, your soul and savior are born. For those that tap into true restraint and sacred purpose, they move to the cosmic stage of Uttara Vajrapada, where one is not bound by outer limitation, so they can reach a height of power and expand endlessly, yet has the inner restraint to only expand as far as they themselves build a strong inner framework to support this growth. The formula is essentially that expansion and growth without restraint and shaping becomes distortion or deformity. Coupled with restraint, it becomes harmony and abundance. Purva Bajrapada is the first part of the formula, while Uttara Bajrapada completes the second part that allows for harmony. In that way, they grow in power larger and larger, but also have the inner control to handle it, and do so in a symmetrical way. In this sense, Shadabahisha is the force of the collective of individuals who do not stand out and who, as an undifferentiated group, control the individual. But Uttara Bajrapada is the transcendent state of the individual who can, through their own intense self-control, overcome all inner weakness and then end up controlling the collective in a positive or negative manner. It is in that sense Uttara Bajrapada men and women who tend to have reputations as secret, shadowed controllers of society and the masses, so much to the point that it's hard to imagine what the world would be like right now without their influence, those always in control, always behind the scenes always speculated about immensely, the main subject of conspiracy theories, deeply feared for their level of shadowed control. In Thelema, Libra Cheth describes this journey through the abyss in that it states, you need to let go of that which you have, whether it be love, wealth, or health. It goes on to say, for if thou dost not this with thy will, then shall we do this despite thy will. Unto thee shall be granted joy and health and wealth and wisdom when thou art no longer thou. In valuing the soul above all things and being willing to lose all things for the sacred soul, one is reborn into a special identity. Uttara Bajrapada's power, Varshad Yamana Shakti, 
is to bring the rains upon this barren desert after the fire and allow one access to all things internal and external, but from a center of control and self-mastery, such as how Lakshmi herself was said to be born under this moon. In that sense, it can be understood that a person demonizes the material world, wealth and abundance, or acts like those things are inherently not spiritual, only when they cannot wield and control those things under their will and their sacred purpose. Liebercheth relates to the tarot card, the chariot, this idea of a charioteer, a juggernaut, pervades the symbols in different cultures relating to this force of nature. In India, there's the charioteer, Arjuna. Belial is depicted as a man riding a chariot. In Africa, Ogun with the train or locomotive. So here you find the chariot trump, which depicts an armored juggernaut sitting on a chariot. Divinatory meanings of this card suggest a person who is extremely fiercely loyal to their integrity at any cost. A death before dishonor understanding found within the story of the Bhagavad Gita. To uphold one's sacred duty without fear. The only thing to fear would be to not uphold that duty. Within the outer freedom and expansion of Porphyrvajrapada, the disciplined man attains perfect peace. The undisciplined man is in bondage. I quote Pierre de la Senec. You must do everything yourself and will be alone in everything. You have to go through a desert where no one else will give you a helping hand, and your only master will be your own conscience, the silent witness and the watchdog of your own truth and depth. If your decision was real, the test will come. Know, however, that no one will tell you if you have missed or where you have failed. The desire to remedy this must again come from you alone. Let your way be led by love, whose depth will be recognized by the one judge who cannot be fooled. So as some of you have noticed, I recently made the decision because of the very consuming nature of the content that I'm creating that it's not possible for me at the moment to produce this kind of content while also making a living off of the astrological chart services. Both require a lot of energy and I wanted to try for a time since so many people request more videos to see if I may be able to better contribute more ultimately by pouring myself fully into this work and research and creating these videos and also my coming website resources that can be informative and enriching to many people all at once. So while I test out this experiment, I'm thinking, chart services will no longer be a financial support for me to fund the creation of these videos so it's a bit of a risk but i will see how it goes and um my hope is that through transitioning into pouring all of my energy into research content and resource creation i will be able to produce a lot more content but that's granted that those who enjoy it are willing to support it so please consider joining me on patreon or sending donations to the paypal link for my patrons, there are some extras and rewards there, such as a Q&A video I did a few months ago, and there's going to be a document uploaded there today that explores in detail different ways that planets can function when they're in Porvabhajapada. And on my website pages that are going to be coming up soon, which is another reason that I turned off chart services for a while, just to see if I could finally get that all finished, there is going to be two extra databases for patrons only to access. Thank you so much to all my current patrons for your support. Thanks for your generosity to my Revati level patrons who are listed on the screen now. And an extra special thank you to my Abhijit level patrons, Ray, Ashley De La Cruz, Avnish Bangar, Grace, Tantric Tara, Shashi, Teresa Green, Semia Hogan, Jewel, Michael M, Iko, Maddie DRX, Kristen, Crystal Perales, and TTHP. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you next time. We was hitchhiking down a long and a lonesome road. All of a sudden, there shined a shiny demon in the middle of the road. And he said, play the best song in the world or I'll eat your soul.